Lime Books present the audiobook of Overpopulation, the hidden agenda for global reset. Episode 4, African Century, Mamadou. Scene 5, Banks flies to Abuja, Nigeria. Banks flew overnight to Lagos with plans to catch the morning flight to Abuja. Upon landing in Lagos, he found the airport under siege with, by protesters and all flights delayed. Protesters had prostrated themselves in lines before passport control. Zipper locked to one another by wrist and ankle, their removal was all but impossible. As quick as security could cut and break one snake of protester, another group would run into place and zipper lock themselves together. Ordinarily, security would bludgeon them into submission. But the world's media were present, covering the arrival of African leaders for the meeting of FAN, the Federation of African Nations. It was a chance to show the world how civilized and progressive Nigeria had become. A sea of blood in the airport terminal would undermine their good works. Even from the transit area, Banks could hear them chanting. With flights being delayed, he had time to kill, and so he read the paper. Nigeria's facing an existential crisis, split down the middle, the Muslim North wants full-blown capitalism, while the Christian South is demanding democratic socialism. He browsed the bestsellers in W.H. Smith's. There were not one, but three biographies on Mamadou. He bought Mother Africa. Its cover showed Mamadou with a thick snake wrapped around her neck. The photographer had captured the snake looking at her with its tongue touching her cheek while she stared optimistically into the distance at a 45 degree angle. It was the kind of artwork that evoked Stalinism pre-Cold War Russia. Does that make her a democratic socialist, he thought? Mamadou was also in the newspapers as she was visiting her hometown of Abuja. It gave him an idea. Scene 6. Kitty Tuppence Having made his flight to Abuja, he was met in the arrivals hall by a tall, imposing woman dressed in a grey Armani suit with knee-length skirt. She had lived in Nigeria for over a decade, but did not fit in. Maybe it was her peroxide blonde hair. Philip, darling, I'm so delighted to meet you. Heard all about. They embraced with kisses to each cheek. You must be Kitty Tuppence. Call me Kitty, darling. I love the sound of my own name. Kitty was the last person you would expect to live in the hot, steamy Muslim northern Nigeria. A white, upper-middle-class native of London, she looked, dressed, and behaved as though she had never left Knightsbridge. How was Lagos? Must have been horrendous. Of course it was, darling. Of course it was. Kitty was an independent lawyer who networked with Nigeria's political elite. She took on legal work sporadically, was a formidable adversary and in every way an exemplar feminist, having carved out a unique career within a male-dominated society. To others, she was a childless, middle-aged spinster who peddled gossip. She was on Delange Martin's payroll as a spy. As they walked to the car park, Banks noticed the sensuous rhythm of her curves. The dizzying overnight flight had not dulled his appetite for an attractive form. Banks lay his case on the rear seat of her white Audi SUV. Well, it's certainly hot here. What's it like living here, though? Like being in a tunnel on a high-speed train, darling. You're heading somewhere fast, but you never know where until you arrive. As Kitty drove away from the airport, Banks asked about the president. He has one problem. Ogbeth, the Minister for Mines and Steel Development, very dangerous man, works for the Big Four, and they run Nigeria. Who are the Big Four? Lagos Mining, Nigerian Oil, Tanko Construction, and the National Commerce Bank of Nigeria. As she drove, Kitty continued her exposition while sizing him up. There have been two attempts on the President's life this year alone. 
Rumour has it Ogbeth is behind both. No proof? None. Whilst running smoothly along the new road surface, the traffic suddenly slowed down. A honking of car horns could be heard approaching. Traffic veered into the hard shoulder, allowing a chain of black SUVs and Bentleys to pass by unhindered. Politicians? asked Banks. Businessmen. Kitty explained that wealthy Nigerians did not suffer rules, or Europeans lightly. Nigerians are the Americans of Africa, and wealthy Nigerians expect priority. As they followed the familiar green road signs into Abuja, Banks noted how modest the surrounding developments were. Nigeria is fabulously rich, but half the population live on $10 a day. Kitty adjusted the air conditioning. As she peeled away her jacket, Banks noted how toned and slender her bare shoulders were. What do you know about war, Winks? West African water, Inc. The president hates it. The people hate it. Only Ogbeth and the Big Four want to sell their water. I see. And how do you see fan meeting going? Africans love to talk. They'll come together, brag about how much they have received from China, then disagree on everything. Do you find living here agreeable? Hmm. I had dreamt of marrying someone rich, a billionaire. There are plenty here, of course, but one cannot operate as a married woman here. Half the country is Muslim. All the interesting people live in Lagos. So poor Kitty is stuck here all alone. Very disheartening. Of course, my sister Lauren went to Saudi Arabia, married a sultan. She leads a life I can only dream of. Surely money is of no problem for someone like yourself. Oh, because I'm related to Lord Martin? Kitty gave his eye and offered the face she saved for the judge. I have never met him. Banks stared at the road ahead and tried to imagine what it would be like to have never met your grandparent despite living in the same city as them. Kitty read his thoughts. I dare say you are closer to Lord Martin than I. I doubt that. Come, Philip, we all know the truth. Banks was taken aback by her use of we. You meet the President on Thursday. Fan meeting is Friday. What would you like to do in the meantime? I'd like to meet Mamadou. I've heard she's in Nigeria. You surprise me. I thought you'd be all business. Can you arrange it? asked Banks. Leave it to Kitty. Kitty can do anything you ask. Scene 7. Palace Resort, Zuma. After two hours' drive, they approached their destination. Before them on the horizon loomed a large grey mountain of stone. Zuma. Locals believe that it landed from outer space. Kitty explained that his hotel, the Palace Resort, had been built on sacred land at the foot of Zuma. To locals, it is the source of black magic. The government built around Zuma, hoping to impress tourists. But it angered the locals, who placed a curse on anyone who visits. Are you superstitious, Philip? Had he answered honestly, he would have had to reveal more about his beliefs than was appropriate. He waited for her to turn to see his reply and said, We are all guided by spirits. Having parked in the Palace Resort car park, Banks suggested, Join me for a drink. It had been a long drive. Kitty licked her lips. She was a lusty woman with curves that touched his trigger each time she moved. You must be tired after your journey, she replied. Not too tired. Kitty refused. They locked eyes. Good luck in there. Half of Africa's media are staying here. Banks began to raise his hand towards her face, when she quickly kissed his cheek and backed away. I'll be back in the morning. Get some rest. She climbed into her car and lowered the window. Tomorrow will be challenging. Banks watched her Audi depart down the slip road and felt embarrassed and disappointed with himself. Why had he made a move on Kitty? 
that wasn't like him to lose his control. Having showered and slipped into a hotel robe, he rolled the door to his balcony and stepped out into the thick, humid night. It was hot, and his ears rang to a symphony of insects. His immediate view was the deep, purple mass of Zuma that caught the light from a brilliant grey moon. He noted a familiar constellation in the sky, when high above the summit of the great rock there appeared a row of tiny pink lights. They circled like a swarm of pinpricks on the sky. It was nearly midnight. Drones? thought Banks. Back in his room, he looked at his double bed, empty, and imagined Kitty's thighs and deep arousing eyes. Zara's smiling face popped into his thoughts. He slept restlessly. The following morning, he opened the curtains, and to be staggered at just how close and enormous Mount Zuma was in the daylight, perhaps twice the height of Ayers Rock. The shape of a giant round face was etched on its side, a soft, round, comical face, in contrast to the black magic spirits hinted at by Kitty. Kitty had arranged for him to meet with Mamadou at midday. He arrived early at the rendezvous point and ordered a drink. Scene 8. Wednesday. Meeting Mamadou. Thanks to Kitty, his meeting with Mamadou was arranged for the lounge in his hotel, the Palace Resort. Mamadou was visiting family in Abuja, a few hours away. They agreed to meet at midday. It was already twenty minutes past. She was late. Banks had finished his drink, a chilled fresh lime with black pepper and a shot of vodka. Whilst waiting, he had read up on her background, but utmost on his mind was what she might look like in the flesh. Will she have security? Will she be in that backless dress she wore in Tatla? Will she wear heels? Will her hair be in that massive bouffant she wore on the book cover? She won't have a snake around her neck. He thought of all the photos he had seen of her. Check the time. She was late, 25 minutes. Had she been a man, he might have left. But Mamadou was different. Hello. Banks turned. Standing over him was a tall, thin girl in a baseball cap, long sports trousers and an oversized T-shirt. Are you Philip? Oh. Banks stood immediately and apologised. He found himself smiling, more as a reaction than for form. Please take a seat. I wasn't sure what you'd be dressed like. He was surprised to consider her more of a tall Asian girl than the glamorous African woman seen in countless photos. I am an ordinary girl. Far from it. I've been reading your biography. Banks held up Mother Africa, the book he had bought at the airport. Oh, I had nothing to do with that. It says in the book that you are interested in politics. If you say so, I have not read it. How did you get on with the snake? He pointed to the cover. Mamadou shrugged and said nothing. I have an idea. I think you're going to like it. Scene 9. Thursday. The Presidential Palace. Banks was met at reception by staff dressed in white. He was ushered into a Spartan room furnished only with a large oval table. Being rainy season, hot and sticky, he welcomed the ferocious air conditioning that caused his skin to ripple with goosebumps. The door opened and in walked President Muhammad. He was average height, slim, and dressed in an elegant suit and silk necktie. Banks recognised Italian quality when he saw it. Although not Savile Row, his suit passed muster. As the president walked towards him, Banks noted the shoes. Gold chains stitched to patent uppers. Alarm bells rang. The president had made a beginner's error. Wore a suit too expensive for his shoes. Banks always wore shoes made in England. That way he could wear whatever suit he liked. Welcome to Abuja, Philippe. It is an honour to welcome anyone from Delonge Martin. Any friend of Lord Martin is a friend of mine. 
Thank you, Mr. President. They shook hands. The President's hands were large and gentle. Banks scored a plus for confidence. They took seats, and the President smiled broadly. Banks marked him down for that. Men in power are seldom open books. Two associates sat either side of the President. My legal team, Nathan Obesanjo, Corporal Liaison and Abegge Fasinu, my chief lawyer. Both scowled at Banks. Coffee was poured. The President noticed Banks look at the selection of colourful snacks on the table. Fish flakes, typical Nigerian snack. Try some. They are delicious. Rule number one when travelling. Maintain the stomach. Don't eat exotic food when on business. Especially not odd, unrefrigerated fish. Thank you, they look delicious. Banks sipped on his coffee and selected a piece of fish flake, which he then put on the saucer of his coffee cup. Now, what can I do for you? The sale of West African Water Incorporated depends on your approval. What will you do? I shall resist it with every bone in my body. We are the largest country in Africa, the richest country in West Africa. Our water supply is our lifeblood. We do not want to sell it. Of course. But a new owner could invest in efficiencies. The people of Nigeria do not want war winks. Usani Ogbeth wants war winks. He and the Congolese put this thing together and they have the Americans pulling their strings. I know. Ruben Segal was here last week. Like you, a banker. I say to him, so long as I breathe, Nigeria will not sacrifice its water for the benefit of foreign investors. Banks couldn't help but smile. He had heard the plea so many times. He had wanted to say, if only the world were that simple. But it wasn't, and the game went on. How did you gain your first seat? I won it by majority vote, 32,618 votes. They said it could never be done. The president was proud, if not a little terse. With the help of the Muslim vote. Yes, my Muslim following has always been strong. Like your faith, perhaps. Yes, like my faith. I understand your great-grandfather was the king of the local Chukwezi tribe. He was. And Usani Ogbeth is a Christian nationalist. Where is this going? What if I were to tell you that Usani Ogbeth isn't what he purports to be? That he isn't Nigerian? That he is a liar and a fraud? That his real name is Michael and he is from Houston, USA? Banks saw the President's smile vanish and his skin turned from deep ebony to mild grey. The President's nostrils flared open wide and fingers curled into a fist on the table. He glanced nervously to his aides, who stared back at Banks aggressively. The advantages of employing Kitty were many. Abuja was a closed-knit community where enemies were always looking to trade secrets, especially those pertaining to devout Muslim presidents with fake credentials. Like Zainab Muhammad, better known as Jordan the Jesuit from Maryland, USA, who had entered Nigeria as an immigrant from the Congo. There followed an awkward silence, as though everyone in the room had strayed from script. The president stood. Melpulmeni, car accident. Banks wasn't sure what it meant, but made a mental note. Now, I have meeting to attend. Please send my regards to Lord Martin. Nathan will look after you. Good day, Philip. Mr. President, I have a final request. What is it? Scene 10. The Goddess. Waiting outside for him was the familiar face of Kitty. He stepped into her Audi and they began the journey back to his hotel. He's nervous. Ogbeth has got to him, but I have secured Mamadou's billing. You've got some cheek. I'll give you that. 
Kitty offered him a deliciously undiplomatic smile. Banks felt the urge to rest his palm on her thigh and give it a gentle squeeze, but since her last rebuff he decided against it. As they slipped onto the highway, the sun fell over the horizon, tainting the lush green landscape with an orange glow. Kitty listened to the music, while Banks considered whether the president was a diplomat or a politician. Varangian Protocols, line 16, verse 33. A diplomat is someone in whom you can confide, because they would rather lie than see you damned by the truth. A politician is someone you must lie to, because they would rather damn you than tell the truth. Does Melpomene mean anything to you? The goddess of melody. She gave him a strange look. You've been helpful. I don't know how I can repay you. Let's get back to your hotel and we will think of something. From the sparkle in her eye, he thought she might be reading his thoughts. <laughs>